This is Wealthy AF, your ultimate guide to understand what it truly means to be Wealthy AF. And today's guest is Rosie Delenskis. Rosie is a 30-year corporate veteran and is here to reveal powerful principles to help you unlock your leadership potential and advance in your career. Rosie's mission is clear, and that is to eradicate the gender gap by empowering women in their careers. And today's topic is going to be women in corporate America or in corporate, wherever you're listening, because we have listeners around the world. Rosie, thank you so much for coming on. I'm excited to have this conversation with you and welcome to the podcast. Thank you, Martin. I am excited about talking about everything women in the corporate world to advance their career. So let's go. Let's go. So tell me your story. I know a little bit about your story and our research when we were researching you and have to have you as a guest. A little bit about your story when you was an underwriter, an insurance company, and that whole thing. Could you share that story with the listeners so they give them some context of who you are? Yeah, absolutely. So I guess I'll start with the one time that I was 40 years old, um, and I'm sitting at my desk and working in the corporate space, and I'm thinking to myself, okay, I'm a high performer. I've done all the things. I'm doing training. I back up my manager. I do all the projects. And any day now, someone's going to come and tap me on the shoulder and hand me a promotion. Well, Martin, nobody ever came. And that's where my story starts, because that's the day that I realized that, wait a minute, nobody's coming. What, what do I, what steps do I take? So I finally went and I talked to an executive vice president. I said, you know, I'd like to be considered for a leadership position. And they, was, they said, really? And I was like, Yes, really. What do you mean, really? I'm a high performer. They're like, you never said anything. And that was the catalyst of my journey into not only my career and working on my career. And uh, three or four months after that, I actually stepped into a management position. And three years after that, I did everything completely different. I did a 180. I started campaigning for me which is where what I call now the custom career roadmap, because women are not, they don't excel in advocating for themselves. And over my 30 year corporate career, I did well enough to go up the corporate ladder, but I wanted to go into that executive realm. And I realized that I needed to advocate for myself. I needed to speak up. I needed to have conversations with people. So I started telling anybody and everybody that would listen to me. I started preparing and eventually I stepped into an executive vice presidential position, but because I prepared so much and over my 30 year career, I had success, but it wasn't until I worked on my career intentionally and with that a custom career roadmap that I finally started to see the results that I really wanted to see. So that's just a little bit about the catalyst of the work that I do today, how I got to uh, becoming an executive vice president with that intention and confidence building. What is the, what are the biggest challenges? Let me not go there. Let me go here first. What was your biggest lesson learned from when you were sitting at that desk and that executive or that manager told you what? And they were surprised. What was your biggest takeaway from that? My biggest takeaway was how could I have not said anything sooner? Why was I waiting for someone to notice my hard work instead of me going out there and telling people about the things that I had already done and have those conversations like I did for my next position? That's the lesson that I really want women that are listening to to our episode here to understand that things you you can't wait for things to come to you. You have to go out there and seek things so that things can happen for you. Why do you think women are and are not that are not in general, right? Like you you were back then, and then you learned a lesson, obviously, and then you kept advocating for yourself, which is amazing. Why do you think most women? don't advocate for themselves. Where does this? Well, I can tell you exactly where it comes from. It's how we're raised, right? So from the time that girls are nine years old, and I'm talking like nine and it's in the number nine, mm -hmm. their confidence peaks at age nine based on research that I, that I um, discovered. And when 
their confidence peaks at age nine when they go into that, you know, fifth, sixth, and then junior high and high school. They're just trying to fit in. They're just trying to figure out the world. They're not really working on their confidence. And then young women don't really, a different type of research says that young women don't really start working on their confidence again until their late 20s or early 30s when they're trying to intentionally advance in that, in that corporate career. A lot of it has to do with the language. And this is going all the way to parents and how we parent our children. And every every mom that asks me, you know, hey, do you have an advice? The, the biggest advice that I have for parents when it comes to having daughters is do not solve all their problems for themselves, for them. Let them solve problems for themselves, even if they fail, because when they fail, they realize uh, they gain critical thinking and they're able to solve problems more and more as, as the age goes on, especially in this day and age where young women are afraid to make phone calls. They're afraid to have uh, difficult conversations or even um, I've known some young people that text that they're no longer wanting to work at their fast food restaurant instead of having a conversation, a face to face conversation with people. So we need to encourage our young young girls and young women to have that those critical thinking skills by us not solving so many things for them. So a lot of it starts with the the fact that so many and I was guilty of this, you know, when my daughter was young, of the helicopter, you know, parenting thing. So we just need to allow our young people and some some young boys, you know, have the same thing too allow them to solve their own problems and let them fail. You're always going to be there to answer questions and support them, but we really need to allow them to to figure things out on their own. I think that women listen to you. You're, in a, you're still a corporate executive, right, at the big insurance company today. Beautiful. So I'm glad to have you here. I actually, I actually left in September, and now I'm a full-time entrepreneur. Okay, so you're a full-time entrepreneur. So when you were, a full, when you were the high-level executive, Let's get to the real meat and potatoes of this thing here. Because this is what women, women, I know you want me to ask this, so I'm going to go ahead and ask this. Okay. For you to promote, what are you looking for as a high level executive leader in a woman or, or let's just say woman, because that's the topic here today. What are you looking for, for you to promote them, promote them and bring them up for those w women that are looking to raise up in their career, you as a leader and your executive team. What are you guys looking for? What is the conversation happening behind closed doors? Because this is what we all want to know. All these right. people want to know this. What's the conversations? What's the playbook? What's the playbook that the one characteristic that they should have that's going to make them stand out and you as the corporate VP executive high level person up there saying, I want her part of our executive team, bring her up. What's that thing? All right. So you know how, well, you know this very well in real estate. The famous quote is location, location, location. In career advancement in the corporate world, I say it's preparation, preparation, preparation. And the reason I know that is because when I went for that executive vice presidential role, I prepared, prepared, and prepared some more. And I was one of 10 candidates. And I cannot tell you that I was the smartest candidate um, or the the one that had the most skills however i was the absolutely most prepared candidate because i made sure that i had my obviously my resume but i had my story vault which is anytime i i had an interview i had all of my accomplishments and that story format relatability i got advice from everybody i asked for feedback i asked people hey how did you do it i i asked people to tell me what what did I do well in this project and what can I do better? I was able to assess my skills. I made sure that I knew my core values. I, I made sure that I understood what my goals were. Like I had uh, tasks and routines that supported those goals. So the biggest thing that we want as an executive when we're looking at somebody to fill our, that role is how prepared are they? How motivated are they to show that they are prepared? So to me, preparation is the biggest component that people can work on 
and and I call this once they have what you know the all of those pieces that I mentioned are part of that custom career roadmap. Once they have that custom career roadmap, incidentally, as they're working on all these pieces about themselves and of course the the skills for the job as well, the more confidence they gain and they're going to be the the most qualified candidate if they do all of the preparation work. When you say preparation, you mean the value, know your value, have your story evolved, all those things that you just shared. So how did you organize that? Well, so, yep. So my custom career roadmap, which is what I call it, has four phases. The first phase is the as the aspiration phase. What is it that the, that you aspire to do? Because it all starts with you knowing yourself, knowing what it is that fulfills you, you know, what is it that you like to do when you're lost in your work and those hours melt away. So you, you it all has to start with what is it that you want to do so that you are happy and fulfilled in the career that you choose. Then phase two goes into that assess, which is where you look at all the knowledge skills, your transferable skills, your core values. You create a mission for yourself, a vision for yourself. And the the knowledge skills, just so that everybody is clear, like if you want to go to law school or if you want to be a lawyer, you have to go to law school. If you want to be a doctor, you have to go to med school. So that's knowledge. The transferable skills are like being able to prioritize, organize all those types of things. So it takes time to to do that phase. Um, The phase three is getting advice. So this is where I was, uh, when I was going through the process, I set up coffee meetings with as many senior leaders that I had worked with. And I, I asked them that question, what do I do well? And what could I do better? And what did you do? How did you do it? And what advice can you give me so that I can move, you know, towards that next, uh, uh, career goal? And then the last piece, which is the piece where I did all the other stuff, but I didn't do this fourth piece, which is the the fourth phase is advertise. So you need to tell people that you are interested in moving into different opportunities, different position, different team, look for jobs outside of the organization. So those four uh, phases put together is what I now refer to as my custom career roadmap because it works really well when you put all of those components together. And Rosie, how did you learn it? Because, you know, when people are working, they're trying to just pay the bills, take care of the kids, walk the dog, you know, take the kids to soccer practice. Where did you learn it? How did you learn it? And what was the, I know a little bit about your story after your divorce, Mm -hmm. you, you, you know, foreclosure and all of that stuff. And why don't you share a little bit about that and, and tell us, that journey on how you learned it and what moved you to to that level because from understanding your story because i read it it's a little bit if it's it's you're kind of night and day or from what i gathered from reading it of course i'm having a conversation with you now sure you were prior to the divorce and then after when you bought the house the kids and and all of that can you share a little bit about that absolutely Well, I found myself in my late 30s going through this really long divorce. It took me four years to get divorced. And actually in 2007, it was kind of the catalyst for me because that's when I found Personal Development Martin. Mm -hmm. And I was so fortunate. I went through um, a Landmark Education Forum, which is a four day. Love it. Yeah. Love it. Like it changed the world. And so before that, before Landmark Education, I was like, oh, my God, I'm going through this divorce and it's horrible. And I'm going to, yeah, I'm going to lose my kids. And then after Landmark Education, I was like, oh, wait a minute. I could lose my kids, but I'm still going to be their mom. I'm going to take care of them and I'm going to make it work. And I'm going to do whatever I need to do to take care of these two little people. My kids were four and six at the time. And after that, Whenever I got a letter, whenever I got, a, I had to go to court, I just had to ground myself and know that I had to surrender. To me, it's God. And I knew that things were going to be okay no matter what. So right around um, my late 30s, finally the divorce ended and I got full custody of my kids. It wasn't an easy process. And I'll just give one super easy example. When my because my kids were little, I bought gifts 
from them for their dad on Christmas, you know, his birthday, things like that. And people were like, why are you doing that? You shouldn't do that. I'm like, no, I'm not doing that for him. I'm doing that for my children because I want my children to see their dad and say, happy birthday, dad. Here's a gift. You know, Merry Christmas, dad. Here's a gift. And I always operated from my highest, best self. And I knew in my heart of hearts that that was the right thing to do for my kids. First, Fine. I, want to, I want to commend you for that. What a, what a, what a start of a gal. Good job. What a start of a gal. That's yeah. Awesome. See, so finally, when the divorce fin- fi- was finalized, I literally had to rebuild myself from the inside out, Martin. Like emotionally, spiritually, financially, I lost everything. And I didn't care. I had my kids. And so I started working. And that's when I started working, focusing on my career again. And the fire that I have in my heart and soul at the time, I still do for my kids. But at the time, it was like, now I have these two little people that depend on me. And I was pretty much the, the sole provider for them. And I knew that I had to do something. And the only way that I could figure out is get promoted, work hard, figure things out. And so you asked me, how did I learn what the custom career roadmap consists of? Is me doing trial and error, making sure that people knew after I that 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 day when I was 40, after that, it was like a whole different ball of, you know, ball of wax. And from then it was like, I just knew that I had to take care of these two little people. That was a fire within myself and I am extremely motivated. And so I started working harder, uh, trying to be more visible within the corporation, trying to talk to senior leaders. And I started tell once I actually got into management, probably year three, I started saying, hey, just so you know, I want to do something bigger, better. I don't know what that is, but if you have any opportunities, you know, can you think of me? So I started creating those advocates for me and it all worked out really well. But going through that dark period in my life, and honestly, Martin, I try not to talk about it a lot because, you know, it it's a, it's a period that happened. It's a situation that happened. I don't dwell on it. I don't think about it anymore. It, it's, it was a long time ago. But it was just a life lesson, a situation. I learned from it and I moved on. So that that's how I typically operate. And, you know, it was just um, I was just hard worker and motivated. So when are you writing the book? You got to write the book on this roadmap thing. that You got to write the book. (laughs) You got to put it in writing because, you know, I was hoping I was thinking you was going to tell me, hey, Martin, I read this book. I read, uh, I don't know, The Magic of Thinking Big or I read Think and Grow Rich or I read you know, some, the four disciplines of execution or, you know, I was, just, I was thinking you was going to tell me, Hey, landmark, amazing. I can, I can tell I, I I'm involved in that community. Um, yeah. I've been involved in that community in the past before. So amazing community landmark is amazing. Absolutely. It's total accountability. There is just, there Absolutely. is, there is zero victimhood accepted in that community. Zero period. And, and a story. I have to- here, I have to share one little piece of landmark, and that's the part where they have you write out your story, and you write it out, and everybody's like, there's probably, I don't know, maybe a hundred people in the room, and everybody's like, you're writing, 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 and you're physically writing at the time, and at the end, when you're writing your story, you, you, your story, you partner up with another individual, stranger more than likely, and you read your story, and then you read it, And you read it and you read it. And at the end, everybody's laughing because you're like, oh, my gosh, this, this, these words on this, on this piece of paper, I was giving them so much power. And now the charge just went poof. And then most people were like, all right, I'm happy. I'm cool, regardless of what's happening around you. So it was, I mean, I owe my life to Landmark. It, it gave me my life back and I will be forever grateful. And this is why you're doing what you're doing now, coming on shows like this and helping others. Good for you. Love it. Good for you. Uh, on Landmark and talk to them, uh, talking about that, you know, they, they it's a great reframe there with you becoming the victor instead of the victim, which is mm-hmm. one of the things I love so much about that community. When you think of women in the workplace, do you think 
that some women victimize themselves in in the corporate world. That's too woe is me. I'm not given the opportunity because I'm a woman, and that's the story they're telling themselves instead of the reframe of I got to get better. I could, I could win. Let me prepare. What is your thought on that? And what do you see? And what have you seen as a corporate leader when you was in corporate and women that wanted to come up? Because I'm sure you probably mentored some women. I mean, I don't know, but I'm sure that women yeah. came to you and were like, hey, can you mentor me? Can you teach me? What do I do? What, what do you see as it pertains to, to that? Women playing the, I am a victim role. You know, I don't really see that women are playing the victim role because they are women. However, the lack of awareness of the things that they need to work on, specifically that they have to work on their careers intentionally, is a huge difference of someone that is promoted and not. Because sometimes sometimes women, uh, they're so busy, they're caretakers for everybody else, and they think, okay, my job, it'll the promotions will come and it'll just take care of itself. But that means that your career is on autopilot. And when it's on autopilot, it may or may not go where you want it to go if you're not paying attention. And so being intentional and taking that action, and it's simple things like being aware. And I'm sure you've, you've heard of the, the um, statistic that they say that men can apply for jobs having 50 or 60 percent of the skills, but women wait to apply for jobs till they have 100 percent of the skills. I heard that statistic about 15 years ago, and that changed my life. And every time I go and do a talk, I always talk about that because if you are interested in a job and you're not applying because you don't have three or five of the job characteristics on the job description, you are holding yourself back. And you may not even know that you're doing it. You think to yourself, oh, you know, that's, that that looks interesting, but I don't have three things on there, so I don't qualify. Well, you're discounting yourself. So what I recommend my clients is apply anyway. Let someone else make the decision that you are not the best candidate for that job. Don't discount yourself from the very beginning. So if you're interested, apply anyway. That's the biggest advice. And again, awareness of how that, you know, when I was at that desk at 40 years old, there was that awareness of you need to speak up and you need to tell people what it is that you want. What is it that you're that you're seeking? And even before that, you need to figure out what it is that you want, you know, so that you can tell others, you know, what you want. What advice are you telling that lady that might be listening to us right now that's feeling bitter, discontent, upset that they got passed up on a promotion. They didn't get the job and they're saying, I didn't get the job. And I know you've heard this before. I didn't get the job because I'm a woman. And he got the job, just like you said, with 60% of knowing what I know or doesn't, that's not a da -da 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 -da, whatever story they're telling themselves, right? What are you telling that lady, young lady um, about that narrative? What's the advice you as a senior executive to make believe you're coaching her right now let's make believe you're mentoring her and she's giving you this bitching and whining about i didn't get the job because martin got it and because he's friends with the blah 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 you know them, mm -hmm. right you've you heard him before what are you telling that girl that lady so i'm a certified high performance coach mm -hmm. and we ask a lot of questions uh during the coaching so the very first thing is show me the list of all of the activities that you did to prepare for this particular interview? That would be my very first question. And then based on what their answer is, then we'll have the conversation. <laughs> it's called accountability. That's what that's called. You're forcing yeah. them to take accountability. What did you do to um, to put yourself in the position to get the role? So good for good. That's a really, really good question. So start with the list of the things that you did. If you're listening, ma'am, or sir, uh, show me the list of the things that you did to, to put yourself in that position. Um, Rosie, what are the biggest challenges that women face in climbing the corporate ladder today? Well, some of the biggest challenges are obviously that, you know, uh, the pay disparity is one. And actually, the pay disparity is hopefully going to get less and less as time goes on because more and more states are bringing the pay transparency laws into the states. So I'm in Chicago and Illinois is bringing the pay transparency law in January of 25, which means that any job that is posted publicly and actually even internally will now have to have the pay grade, the pay range. And so that's going to be helpful for 
for the pay disparity. The gender gap, I think we're all working towards. I think, Martin, this is a really good time in history where I see so many women. There's so many women like myself out there, and we're all kind of pushing collectively to make way for those younger women that are coming up behind us. And we're all collectively trying to teach, trying to educate. And I think the biggest thing is lack of awareness of what it is that you need to do. And so the the gender disparity is always going to be there, but you have to make yourself visible. You need to make sure that you are prepared. And if you're not prepared, then get a coach, get a mentor, get an advocate, you know, get a buddy at, at work and say, hey, do you want to work on these things together? There's so many different things that women can do to try to close that gender gap and that pay disparity. And we have to do it and we have to do it collectively. We are not going to be able to do it individually and alone because it it, it's something that all women have to fight for together. I like the fact that you said that women, you know, older women are kind of collectively pushing to teach, you know, to make the way for younger women. I think that's so important. I think that's so needed. I think that's so, so needed. And I'm, I'm so glad that you're doing what you're doing, especially, you know, older women, us, all of us as older, older individuals, it's our role to teach younger people and give them the truth. Like I, I give them the truth. Like you just said it, like, are you prepared? Or what are you doing to prepare yourself? They like, give them the truth. You are not going to get it just because you think you're going to get it. You're not going to. I'm speaking as an entrepreneur now, as a CEO, as a business owner. I'm not just I'm not just going to give someone a, 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 an opportunity just because they think right. they're going to get it. Speak up, ask, request, me, ask for mentorship. I'll mentor you. Ask me, what do I need to do? That like, you nailed it. Like you nailed it. What are the things that I need to do to get there? And you will be told that it's important that us, the older people, the senior people, you ladies tell the younger women, no, this is not going to happen just because you're pretty or just because you're smart or just because you work later. Just You have to know what you want. You have to know where you're going. And so, but you got to give them the good, the bad, and the ugly. It's going to take work. It's not going to be easy. Yeah. It, it took, it took a lot for you. You went to Landmark. You, you did the work. You committed. I mean, what you did, it's a big person. It takes a heck of a big human being to go sit, sit with an executive and say, hey, Mr. Or Mrs. Executive, where am I dropping the ball? Where can I improve? And you got to sit there, baby, and you got to take that criticism and then go back and reflect on that. You know, there's a principle. I don't know if you've read the book, um, Principles by Ray Dalio. And one of his principles, I love this principle, and it is pain plus reflection equals growth. Yes, I love it. Pain plus reflection equals growth. So when you're going with that executive and that executive says, you really want to know? And you're like, yeah, well, you're too sassy. You need to clean it up a little bit. You need to tone it down a little bit. You don't know how to present yourself. It's not easy to receive that. It's not easy to receive that, but you got to go back and reflect and adjust because that's where the growth happens if you really want something. So thank you for doing what you're doing. And um, I hope that you're coaching them in that way. And you're just, <laughs> I know you are because you come from landmark. So I don't, I don't even have to, <laughs> I don't even have to, I don't even have to uh, uh, question that. What advice would you give to young women who are just starting out in their career, Rosie? The biggest thing that I would say to women that are just starting out is have a plan. Because without a plan, then you're just kind of flailing. So again, my version of, you know, the custom career roadmap, which is just your personalized plan of those four phases that I talked about, create a plan. And don't just write goals down, though, because you have to understand what your objectives are in life, you know, attach that to goals, but then you have to support it with tasks and routines as well. So the first of the year, everybody is great and they write down goals. But if you don't take action, Martin, that's where the goals are just words on a piece of paper. So I always end everything that I do, whether it's social media or my No Woman Left Behind podcast or whatever, with be brave, be bold, and take action. So that's what I'm going to say as advice. Be brave, be bold, and take action. Amazing advice. Do you think that sometimes women underestimate their own abilities compared to men in the workplace? Yes, but men also underestimate their abilities too. Men are not invincible. Men also have a lot of these um, challenges. Not all men are confident. Not all men are superb at doing work. So it's not just women, but yes, you know, some Sometimes we underestimate our abilities of what we're capable 
But if you start planning, working on it and preparing all of those, um, all of those things that you're thinking about, those negative beliefs about yourself, they just dissipate. What's the one thing that holds women back in the workplace that you find in your coaching, in your career, your long career, that holds women back in the, in the workplace and how do they overcome it? A lot of women come to me and they say, Rosie, I need to work on my self-confidence. Can you help me work on my self-confidence so that I can work on my career? And I said, actually, it's kind of two and two and one. As you're preparing for, you know, all of those phases that I talked about, you are inherently working on building your confidence. So it's kind of like it goes like this, your preparation, your confidence. It's two in the same. You can't just work on your confidence because without the preparation, you're not going to feel confident. It's when you're preparing, when you're doing the work, when you're doing that introspective work when you're talking to people, when you're networking, you're building all of those pieces that we already talked about. When you're working on all those things, your confidence inherently grows. And that's when you become what I call promotion ready. Because when that next opportunity comes in, you already have all of those pieces. You already have the confidence and more than likely you're going to be the best candidate for that position. I, it's like something I teach my students when I coach them. I teach, uh, I coach uh, people that, that want to become real estate investors. And one of the things that they, that often comes up with me is the same thing. Hey, I, your confidence and this stuff. How do you run the numbers and that? They say, you know why I'm confident? It's because competence equals confidence is the things I do when no one is watching that makes me confident. And what is that? So I'm watching the market. I, I study the market. I understand the data. I understand interest rates. I understand what's happening in the market. And so when I speak or I'm negotiating, I can, I'm competent. So it comes off as confidence, but it's like you said, it's competence and, 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 and competence competence and confidence are parallel to one another. So the more that they prepare, the more confident, the more confident they become, I think is what I'm gathering from what you're, yes. you're, you're saying, which is kind of the same thing I teach. It's like, hey, know your numbers, know how to run the numbers, know what the rehab cost is, know what the rental value is, know what you have to repair. When you know everything, when you know every step of the way and you have multiple exit strategies, you are competent. And therefore, when you speak, you speak with Con yes, I love it. I totally love it. And if I just may add one last thing, Martin, is uh, Jamie Kern Lima. She was the founder of It Cosmetics. She recently sold It Cosmetics to L'Oreal for $1.2 billion. She wrote a book called Worthy. It just released in February. And she says that a lot of times women struggle with that self-worth and that self-confidence. So in real estate terms, what she says is self-worth is the foundation of the home. So it's what's underground. So it's the, the cement, you know, reinforced by rebarb and all those things. So that's self-worth, internal work. The house that goes on top of the foundation is the self confidence. So to your point earlier, when you get criticized for whatever or get feedback that, you know, we're all human. So every time we get negative feedback or a criticism, you know, it kind of stings a little. Mm -hmm. So think of the house and that self-confidence is that external. And if someone gives you that criticism, it's kind of like someone throws a rock through the window, it breaks the window. So then what do you need to do? You need to go and you need to patch the window and fix it. So you need to work on whatever feedback they gave you. You need to listen to the feedback, apply it and take action. And then that's how you build a strong home with a strong foundation for your self-worth and an external house for your self-confidence. That's a great analogy. Really good analogy. Really good analogy. And my, so I got two final questions for you. So what's the one elite strategy that can help women get what they want in the workplace. One was that one thing that you would recommend? Uh, I would say building that self-confidence through preparation. Building that self-confidence through preparation. Prepare, 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 guys. Competence equals confidence. I mean, it's amazing. Was there something we didn't cover that we should have covered that will empower women and the listeners um, that we haven't covered as of yet? The only thing that we haven't covered is that I would ask anybody that's listening out there to share that uh, statistic that girls' confidence peaks at age nine. And if they can allow younger children to problem solve on their own, I think we're going to make our society so much better going forward as a whole. That's a great stat. I never heard that stat before. Thank you for sharing that because it was just giving me some reflection on my daughter. 
right? And how I can make her better. And funny, yesterday we were having dinner and started talking to my daughter about her femininity and her being in a feminine energy and things like that. And and <laughs> and so we stopped. My phone rang or something, and my wife was like, well, "Are you going to stop? What, were you going to continue with the church? And in other words, am I going to continue with my sermon? Because <laughs> I'm always talking. You know, I'm always talking. I'm trying to empower my daughter mm -hmm. to be the best version that she could be. I think it's dark in our home. Um, like you said, how can I do that? How can I let my daughter pop? You know, troubleshoot some things. She's starting a business now, so my daughter's just starting. She's a real estate. Well, she's a real estate agent, and uh, she's also she's also an artist. She's always always been an artist, so she's opening up her own tattoo shop. So mm -hmm. she she's got that going on. So you know, I have a lot of experience in business, so I'm I'm naturally I'm helping her. But how can I let her troubleshoot some of these things so that she can become better? So thank you for that. You you've got my my you got my brain thinking, and you got me. Let me think. You got me thinking some things here. So, if people wanted to get a hold of you, Rosie, maybe some women are listening, or someone is listening. I think my mom, my wife needs to needs to be coached by Rosie. Um, how do they connect with you? How do they How do they find your program? Where do they find your content? I know you mentioned the podcast. Tell us about that. Where do they connect with you? How do they follow you? How do these women get in touch with you? Sure. The easiest way is to going on my website, which is No Woman, and it's W O M A N. So it's nowomanleftbehind.com. So all the links to my podcast, my coaching, uh, my company does, we do resume, professional resumes, things like that. So there's a lot of great stuff right on the website. I, I want to say this, you know, for the short stint that I did in working in corporate America, I actually worked for insurance companies. I was an insurance salesman. That's where I started my career. Okay. He was a young underwriter. So he was rejecting my cases, bro. <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, for my short, for my short stint, in, in the corporate world, um, I will tell you this: that the service that you're offering, I, I, as I reflect back and I think and I think back on it, the service that you are offering is super valuable because people, most people, want better. They just don't know how to do better, mm -hmm. and we're stuck. And we we all need a mentor. We all need a coach. And a lot of us don't know how to start where to go. A lot of us are just throwing our resumes together. Guys, I know I know you hear me because I used to do it, right? Throw your resume, find something online, copy, paste, copy your resume. Copy, let me take a little bit of words from this one. Let me take, and they don't know how to articulate and really prepare. So coaching, having a mentor, that is just absolutely invaluable to one's success. You need it. It's one of the most important and best investments that you will make on yourself is on that. Thank you, Rosie, for doing what you're doing. Women, if you're listening, you need a you need a you need a mentor. I know a lot of women need mentors. I know because I mentor some of them. I have good friends that we're just friends and they're in corporate and you know, I come with an entrepreneur mindset. So, you know, they're like, hey, I'm applying for this job and and, and I'm like, hey, you know, here's what I would be looking for. Here's how I'm looking at you if you're coming to me with this thing. And so I know women, a lot of women out there need what you're doing. So thank you for doing what you're doing. And please keep doing what you're doing, Rosie. Thank you so much, Martin. This was a wonderful conversation. Same here, hon.